Okay. Um, welcome to the user experience in gaming um, panel. Uh, this is an academia industry panel uh, that we put together uh, to talk about user experience um, problems as well as uh, personnel and training and, and issues that we think um, are around. Um, I'm Bill Gamutlu. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, I, uh, I do research and training in human-computer interaction, um, i.e. User, user experience. Um, I co-direct uh, a program called Mad UX. Uh, downstairs you can see a booth uh, on our program and, and Jenny there will uh, be happy to give you more information. Uh, it's an online user experience design uh, certificate program. And we are uh, slated to create master's programs and more focused programs for industry um, in, the, in the coming years. Uh, so uh, ga gaming and games and uh, game software generally is an area that we're really interested in. Uh, partly that's why we're here, uh, to interact with, with you and hear from people. And what we'll do today um, is, uh, for the next hour, um, I'll introduce the panelists. Uh, they'll introduce themselves a little bit. Uh, then we'll talk for a few minutes with sort of uh, questions that we came up with uh, to outline the space a little bit. Then we'll open it up and have a discussion all together. So if you have any questions uh, in this space, it can be anything. It can be uh, silly questions, uh, complicated questions, specific questions, general questions, whatever it is, uh, please prepare. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce the first academic uh, panelist, Matthew. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Matthew Berland. I'm a professor of, uh, oh, yeah. I should turn that on. Um, hi, I'm Matthew Berland. Oh, I'm, pl I'm plenty loud even for the mic, Bill Gay. Um, uh, I'm Matthew Berland. I'm a professor uh, in curriculum instruction, which is in the School of Ed. Um, and I'm crossed into the iSchool and, uh, um, and in computer sciences as well. So I study uh, the design of learning environments. So I design games uh, to understand better how people learn and how better to design games. And I also run the, the nascent game design program, which I doubt very many of you have heard of because we are very nascent uh, at uh, uh, UW-Madison. If you're interested more about that in particular, we are having a panel this afternoon called UW Madison and Games, I believe, in the same room, and we are going to talk about it uh, ad nauseum uh, there. Uh, I'm Timothy Gerritsen. I'm studio director for uh, Fantasy Flight Interactive, which is a new offshoot of Fantasy Flight Games that we started up here in Madison. Uh, this is my 25th year making video games. I've always been on the game entertainment side, making a uh, game product for just about every platform that's existed in the last 25 years. Uh, everything from, uh, I started out making flight simulators, A-10 Tank Killer, Aces of the Deep, and most recently, Bioshock Infinite, and a ton of games we did over the last five years of Human Ed. And so I've, I've got a fair panoply of stuff that I've put out. And I put together a little conference called MDiv. So. <clears throat> Uh, hello, so I'm, I'm Ben Geisler. I've been uh, working in games for 17 years. Right now I'm running a consulting company called Thawed Codebase. I used to have a company called Frozen Codebase up in Green Bay. Um, prior to that I was at Raven and Human Head. Um, made a bunch of games, Quake 4 and Soldier Fortune 2 and Hulk Ultimate Destruction, Prototype, a um, bunch of stuff. And um, I also teach, so it's kind of interesting that, that way. I, I'm a lecturer at UW Green Bay. Um, and I also am working my contract job through Thawed Codebase is with a drone provider in Oregon where I'm doing drone visualization, which is basically a simulation for drone pilots to teach them how to fly drones. And we use the Arma engine for that. So it's sort of simulation gaming, which is kind of fun and has a lot of UI UX issues. So that's my background as far as the industry goes. Great. Um, so this is our, this is our panel. Um, the idea for this panel came out from a discussion that, that Tim and I and a few other people were having about um, what is you know what is what is, what does the market and, and uh, industry look like uh, in we were talking about Madison in general um, and what are the problems what are the ways in which academia could help industry um, and one of the topics that came up was user experience and this was an area that was outlined as a um, as uh, not enough has been done or is being done. Uh, and one of the issues that, that, one of the reasons that we identified in that conversation was 
um, that there weren't enough people who were trained in, in the space to actually address user experience issues. Um, and uh, companies were possibly, developers were, uh, were not uh, taking these issues and, and addressing them. Um, uh, maybe they, you know, maybe there are demands in the industry, maybe there are, um, you know, cultures within companies, we, we don't know, but we sort of had an open discussion about this and decided to bring, bring it here um, and uh, we can talk about this, we can tell you what our thoughts are, but I think it's, it's gonna be great to get some input from you um, on any experiences that you might have and we can respond to that here. So what I'd like to do next is uh, to get perspectives from each panelist on um, fleshing out that problem space a little bit better. Uh, I'm gonna first turn to Tim because this is something we talked about and you have a better view of industry in general at least in this region, because you're interacting with many companies. Um, so what, what are the UI issues? Why do you think we're talking about issues rather than exciting new developments? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? In terms of UX specifically? Yeah. Or, um, I think UX is one of those areas that has been little understood, and I've found it to be an area that with quite a bit of growth over the last few years. Because early in the industry, we you know every game, it was, we're staking new ground, building new territory, and nobody knew what the hell they were doing. So we were learning the ru rules just by making them and breaking them in a lot of ways. And if you go back and look at a lot of classic games, a lot of them have really just crappy interfaces. Really, the, the UX isn't well thought through because we, just, we didn't know anything. So we just started putting things together, saw what worked, what didn't. Uh, and, and now I think over the course of 40 years of game development, you start having a body of... Uh, Examples. Examples, yeah, to work from. And you can see what actually works and what doesn't. And you know, from my perspective on the entertainment side, I'm all about player perspective in, in user experience. Everything from, from my standpoint in design is from the player's perspective. You always should be thinking about, you know, I am the user, what am I you know, seeing? You can't, you, you can't ship a person in a box or uh, over digital to explain things to you. You have to make a game that you have to make a game that is self-evident and you can understand what's going on. So I think, I think it's an area now that has quite a bit of interest uh, just because it is an area now we're taking seriously and, and approaching academically and, and, and with some real thought behind it and not just, you know, usually it was, I don't know, some spare programmer over in the corner. Hey, you go, didn't have anything else to, yeah. Hey, whip together a UI, well, yeah, and it used to be very late in the day. And in my own experience in the industry, I, I had the fortune of starting a company called Dynamics way back in '92, and I don't know if anybody remembers them. They did, come, they did games like Red Baron and uh, Willie Beamish and Space Quest V and stuff like that. And we did something what we called Shell. You designed the shell first, and that, that today that's what you would call UX. It was we sat down and decide, defined all the rules by which you enter the game and move through the game and flow through the game. First, that was the first thing we did because it defined everything you did from there. And I've never worked anywhere else that did that because everybody else is like, yeah, UI, we'll get to that. And for me, it was just this enlightening experience because if you look back at their games, they still hold up because there was so much forethought. So I'd also like to hear yeah. Ben's thoughts on that. Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm gonna start with a horror story of UI that I just thought of a second ago here while I was just talking. Uh, our first game at Frozen Codebase, which we learned a lot on, but didn't end up doing very well, uh, Screwjumper. It was on Xbox Live Arcade, and we had about 52 different versions of the UI, I wanna say. I mean, it was a nightmare. Um, what would, things would happen like, you know, people would eventually figure out that, wow, this is really bad, we gotta fix it and someone would go in there and fix it, and then we'd come in in the morning and everything would be different. Um, it, it was just, it was the worst case scenario. And you know, over the years we learned, uh, and I think it sort of, our struggles with UI sort of parallel the struggles the industry had, because we had a lot of new folks there um, that, you know, and I wasn't new at the time, but we had a lot of new people there doing the UI, and I was new to UI at the time. So I think that we learned over the course of time that you can't take it as a second class citizen um, and our, those failures just helped us improve to the point, I think Scary Girl's UI was very good. Burger Time World Tours was pretty good. Um, I think that we just learned things the hard way, um, that you shouldn't be changing the UI last minute at two in the morning and then seeing what people think the next day to figure out whether or not that was a good idea. Um, you have to plan it out. As you said, like the shell, like 
you have to actually think about what you're doing. You can't just sort of have a programmer do it last minute and just throw some stuff together and say, well, it works because all my functionality, you can see it. You can see this thing flashing and this meter is going up or whatever. But should that meter be going up in that spot? Like, where should that go? It, it's a very hard problem. And um, yeah, I think it's really underappreciated. I was, uh, later I was fortunate enough to do, I did um, UI on Prey 2, um, you know, before the untimely cancellation of that. And I remember we were studying a ton of different games having good UI, like Deus Ex, Human Revolution, and stuff like that. And some of these games that just had great UI. Um, and I think that's what we're doing now. We have this, this database of we know what games are do it well and we know what games don't. And so now we have that body and we just have to pull from it. Meanwhile, I'm not sure if, like on the academic side, I don't know, like I, I haven't taught a UI class yet or anything, so um, I'm not sure what's going on there, but um, that's something that I, I feel like we could maybe be pulling from that knowledge, you know, and maybe be um, having examples, class examples, and saying, oh, well, do a UI like this game, and what were the pros and cons of it, or should you do that, or, you know, um, just drawing from examples similar to how they would like in an art history class or something like that, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think we know a lot about user, user experience and user design, one of the, uh, but uh, the, uh, one of the tricky things is it's very expensive to do it the academic way, right? Um, <laughs> and this is something when we butt, we butt up against is not right. I work with the commercial de developers mm -hmm. pretty frequently. I've, I've designed a bunch of uh, uh, games and exhibits. With, but in, in our side of the world, we think a lot about things like participatory design towards user experience, where we, where we have a bunch of people come and do the initial designs mm -hmm. with us before we start thinking that much about the mechanics, right. right? I mean, as a game designer, as a game developer, a lot of times you wanna say, I've got these really sweet mechanics. I'm, it's gonna be sort of like, it's gonna be a role and play and it's gonna be terrible and we're gonna walk around a board and it's gonna be super boring. Let's do that. Um, that's not. Not that's, not, that's, not, that's not what you say. No, you start, you, know, you start with mechanics, you're like, oh, I'm thinking about this deck builder, but it's gonna be like a super sweet deck builder. Um, and that, that's fun. We know we've had, played plenty of super fun deck builders, but if you're not thinking about how the users are experiencing them and spending time with them, and literally watching why your awesome, super sweet idea that's super sweet to you is not actually that fun with, for the people that you're playing, way before you're play testing, way before you're play testing, um, then you've built all this stuff up and you've got a thing that's not gonna be, res that's not gonna um, connect to, to the people but when, uh, that, that you want to play your game. Sorry, I feel like I'm- Oh, no, 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 I was good. You said something I, I wanna respond to is I feel like uh, that, that, I think a lot of what happens in game developers, especially small game development companies, you don't have the ability to go out and sort of find people to play test and, and try your theories. Yeah. So a lot, of, a lot of it is pure theory until it hits, hits the road. Yeah. And I think that's where people get into trouble. Because you know, you, you got companies like Microsoft or larger companies I've worked to worked at where we bring in people and they play the games and we watch them, we videotape them, and then we obsess over it. Uh, you know, you learn so much because uh, uh, you know I go back to uh, we worked on uh, Rune. We did Rune for PlayStation Two. Uh, we went to Gen Con with it, and first guy walks up to it. He's like, "Yeah, I want to check this out." It was a Viking action game. You can swing swords and chop people's heads off and arms off, and he picks up, it was the PlayStation 2 version, he picks up the controller, first thing he does is look at the floor. Right. And now he's walking around looking at the floor. <laughs> and there's like, like literally, <laughs> stuff's coming up and hitting him and he's walking around like this. He's like, what the hell am I doing? And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's when uh, a look spring came yeah. about. Yeah. That was in the early days before Halo kind of proved that you could do first person shooters and third person action games and make them work. That's when, that's before Look Spring came about. Like, hey, you should have the controller look back up if they're not touching it. You know, back then, you just, you look down, you look down. You looked up, you look up. And if, if the guy walked away and he's looking at the sky, the next person came up and just picked it up while and walked around. Hitting back. While someone's hitting him in the back with a sword. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a, my, um, s sort of the, th the theory from my, my side of the world would say, that it's, there's so many different benefits to, to involving users multiple times, but that the number one rule for anything in my side of the world is iteration. So every, every iteration of everything is that, and if you don't know any theory, um, which is fine, obviously it'd be better if you understood some of the theory, um, but you play it a million times and every time you look what's going wrong and you change it, and every time you retry it and you change it, and you listen and you watch and you listen and you watch, it's gonna be good. 
Um, but if you have the, you've impl uh, implemented all the theory, you read every single book, you got the stack this high, you're like, I really am feeling game feel. I've got it. Um, that's a book. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, then you try and implement that, but then you just send it out into the world. People are going to be like, this is, this is terrible. And you're like, oh, man, the theory failed me. And, I, and that's the point as, as a professor where I'm like, oh, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, feel, I feel like UI and UX, because the reason it's been unsung for so long in the industry is because when it works, players don't notice it because it just works. It's unsung because you don't, the only time you really realize it's, it's there is when it's not working, mm -hmm. when it's bad, because you're frustrated. You're not able to do things you want to do. You're not able to make it perform the way you want it to perform. And so because of that, it's deceptively simple. People mm -hmm. are like, oh, that just works. Let's just do what they do. But there's a lot of thought process that goes into that. And, and so if we're doing our jobs right, nobody knows that you did it. Or at least they only know <laughs> occasionally, right? So it's something we talk about a lot is this idea of friction. This is a big idea, in, 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 again, in, in my side of the world, is we don't want to make everything frictionless, or else you're not playing a game. You've just started up a movie, and then now you're done. Um, there was no friction. But you have to be very, very careful about where that friction goes, and you don't Sometimes you actually want it to be in the UI or in the UX, um, but you have to be very thoughtful. Like if you're going to make that button frustrating, you better have a good reason to make that button frustrating, um, or you don't want people to see that feature very often, or or whatever it is. Um, I, I, I saw an interesting um, uh, little blog post the other day about why the down arrow on uh, Breath of the Wild on the left side is call your horse. <laughs> right? And the answer was that, the, as far as anyone could tell, it's that they felt like there were too many other options. And they were like, no one's going to use that, right? Like, I mean, you're going to use it every once in a while, but the, this is something you can just let your brain forget. You've got seven plus or minus two, or whatever, things that you want to keep in mind at all times, and that, we just hit the limit. So down is call your horse, I guess. Um, and thinking about the ways that you've added <laughs> friction to things that maybe didn't, maybe it would, should have been switch weapon, right? Which you used, switch between two top weapons or something like that, that you would have used all the time, but that would have added um, uh, an, an extra thing to remember. Well, and, and controllers, uh, especially in console world, controllers have gotten so much more complicated. I mean, you go back to the Atari, you had one button. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, know, you have very weird and complex games from that era. Like, have you ever played an old fighting game called Budokan? It had this crazy set of, it was a one, one joystick, one button, but it had, had controls that were as complex as Street Fighter. And to pull that off was amazing. And nowadays you have controllers with so many buttons on them. And it, it's, you've gotten to that point where it is almost saturation overload. Even the Switch controller, you got plus and minus, you got the triggers, you got the buttons on both sides, you got both sticks, and you got select start and home. And you know you, it is very easy to kind of get away from the player and what they can do. So full disclosure, I played Super Mario Odyssey before coming here today. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, it is a, and it just sort of reminded me that we were giving, that we were having this panel because it is a UI miracle. And I would love, um, and, and I, I encourage all of you to uh, play it uh, when you get a chance and just sort of think about how smooth the decisions you're making um, are vis a vis the interface, all the complexities of what's happening there, how complex the world is vis a vis the, the options you have. And I th my first thought was, the first thing they thought was, this is going to feel right, and the user experience is going to be perfect. Now let's do some level design. Because you could tell that that was so high on the totem pole for them. I mean, I think that that gets into what Tim was saying about like players first. Um, that's a mentality. I think, um, oh, what's, what's that book, Weissman or something? There, there's, a, there's a book written, Weiss, no? I don't know. Oh, no, Tracy, Tracy something from USC. She oh, writes yeah, a good Tracy book. Fullerton. Tracy Fulton, Fuller, yeah, or Fulton. F Fullerton. Fullerton, Fullerton, Tracy Fullerton. Uh, she talks about that in her Games Workshop book, which is a great book about player-first design. Absolutely. And I think that that is what we need in UI UX, because if you're not thinking about what the player is going to be feeling, it doesn't matter what awesome levels you have. You know, it, you can have the best levels ever, or you can have the worst. It doesn't matter. It's just what... What the what the player like the player mechanics and how the UI relates to those mechanics has to be solved first before you can even take on those issues, Absolutely. those challenges. So yeah. yeah. Well, I think I think the challenge is UI and UX permeates everything you do in a game, and it really doesn't matter if it's a complex game or a simple game. It, it 
From, from the moment, if you're on a PC, from the moment you click on an icon, including clicking on that icon, everything that happens is an aspect of UX and UI. And so I think everybody, even if, if, if you're a level designer, you're a programmer, you know, these are issues that you need to be thinking about. I, when we were working on Bioshock Infinite, I remember constantly, we, it was getting beaten into every designer's head that, you know, what am I seeing? What am I perceiving as the player? Everything I do right now has to be perceived from the player's perspective. What is going on? So even, you know, if a level designer, it's like, oh, well, I, you know, you walk down this hall. And we would do level reviews that were kind of epic because, you know, we'd have 10, 15 people in a room and Ken Levine would come walking in. He's like, okay, show me what you got. And the designer would boot it up and start walking down the hall and he goes, stop. He's like, well, I'm just getting to the point where, no, why are you walking down that hall? It's like, what? No, why are you walking down that hall? Why is I, why as I a player am I gonna be walking down this hall? Are you thinking about that? What the hell's going on? What is compelling you to go down this hall? And you know, it's always about what am I thinking about as a player? You know, because a lot of designers get very much in their own head of, okay, man, I'm gonna make this sequence because it's gonna be really complicated and they're gonna go down here and they're gonna see this thing. And then players walk right by it and never see it. And it's, you have to be thinking about from the player's perspective and everything you do, whether it's controls, whether it's menus. I think menu design is it often heavily overlooked. A lot of people use templates. They use tried and true uh, sort of old standbys that they bring to their games. I feel like every game you do, you have to apply a fresh look at how the UI and UX works. You can't just make a template and say, okay, I'm gonna use it on this game and I'm gonna transfer it to that game and I'm gonna transfer it to that game. You'll get every classic awesome game. The UI and the UX in the original Super Mario is not the same as Mario 64, is not the same as Mario Galaxy, is not the same as Mario Odyssey. You know, they rethought everything from the ground up every game. All right. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm gonna so grab we're, we're one question in. To, to, yeah. <laughs> Uh, to make sure that other people get to talk, too. Um, I'll let these guys talk. They'll talk all day. <laughs> um, so something that Tim said earlier, um, culture and process. Uh, so I, I think everyone here is in agreement, and I don't think anyone would deny that there's a player-centered perspective that you have to take to make user experience better, right? Um, but there are two questions here, right? Well, how do you do that, and who does it? Is it all game designers? You know, you, you, you said earlier that, well, you know, some, some guy in the corner would be told to fix the UI, right? <laughs> well, that's one guy in the corner. It's not a part of the team. It's not the culture of the company. Like, how, do, how does that work, right? So I, I gave a talk at um, Epic a few years ago. The title of the talk, I think, was um, Better UX in Under 15 Minutes, right? There are actually things that every developer, every designer can do that will improve the UI. They can take a user-centered perspective, and it doesn't take that much that much time and effort, right? So um, what, what uh, Matthew said was it's costly. If you try to do a full on, you know, I'm gonna make this totally user centered and all that, sure, that's costly, but there are actually little things that people can do. They can be trained in or they can just pick it up. Um, that, would, that would change the culture, that would change their process and, and everyone will become the UX person, right? It's not a dedicated person anymore. Um, but how do, you, how do you guys see in, in your respective companies and sectors, like is there a person, is there a process, and how does that permeate into the culture? Um, it, I think for me it's always dependent on the company. Um, for example, um, when I was doing UI, when I was that guy on Prey 2, I mean it was myself and a designer, and we were tackling that as, as our thing. And that's how it is a lot of times, like someone specifically is doing UI. And unfortunately sometimes I think it gets handed off a little bit too much as well. Like, some programmer will do it for a while. Usually the designer is consistent, and uh, usually the artist is consistent. But it feels like the programmer gets handed off, like you know, the, the artist might be working with a certain person one day, and then the next day that programmer is pulled off onto, quote unquote, something more important, you know? Which really gets at what Tim was saying, it's like this unsung hero kind of situation because it's done at the last minute. Um, so I think it, it, there usually is these days, it's different than what it was back, back in the day when it was just random people, but now I think there's usually someone that's at least designated to that, but I do feel like maybe it's not, people don't have that sense of ownership over it like they should, and it's not treated with that same level of priority that um, say, uh, like performance is, right? Like performance is huge, like if, if the game is suddenly slow, then all the programmers are focused on performance. That isn't the case, if the UI is a disaster, there's one guy trying to fix it. There's not, you, you know, usually, there's not like, it's not a concerted, sort of effort, whereas you said, like, it should be. It could be, like, 
a, a designer, a designer that's not related to the UI could be affecting the UI in, in ways that he doesn't know about or something, which would be really nice to see. So that's my perspective at least. So I think it's evolved over time. Um, I've evolved over time. Like I said, I, I'll go back to my dynamics experience. We actually had a team whose job it was to be the shell team. So they thought about this all day long. They were thinking about this. They had programmers and artists together. And they would go around from team to team. Now, not, not every company is going to have that luxury. I would say it was definitely a luxury there. It was, it was really cool to see because we would go sit down with them, talk about what we wanted to see, how we wanted to do it. And they put together sort of the tools and framework for us to be able to make it happen. Uh, and then I've seen the other side, which is, the, you know, hey, uh, we're two weeks out for sh uh, from shipping, throw together a menu, uh, you know, which is the opposite end of the spectrum. I, f I feel it comes from a central vision holder. Somebody has a vision for the game and how they want it to carry out. And they communicate their vision. So, you know, like Warren said in his talk this morning, there's, you know, he lays out the vision and defines the box. And I'm very much an adherent to defining your box because I think it doesn't remove your creativity. It enhances it. It focuses your creativity because you know where the limits are, and then you can start testing them. If you don't know what your limits are, testing them means nothing. If you know what your limits are, that's when you can start really testing them and really putting together some interesting stuff. And I think a strong vision holder is the key to that. They come up with the idea. They lay out the stakes of how they want it to be. And then they, they convince and proselytize and get their team to be solidly around that vision. Uh, and then, like Warren said, then you sit back and let the, the, the stagecoach take you to Amarillo. And when it gets a little off track, you nudge it back on track. But I think it starts there and then permeates. The games that I work on are a lot smaller. And I think the smaller the game, the more important the user experience and the more important the, the UI. And so you know, I'm thinking about teams like Asher Vollmer and uh, Greg Woland, where Basically, one of them is responsible. They made uh, threes and hundreds and ridiculous. Uh, no, they didn't make ridiculous fishing. What, uh, and they, Temple Seed is the, the most recent one. Yeah. A, a variety of just literally, truly awesome, wonderful, uh, meaningful games. And I highly recommend actually sort of uh, to read the postmortem on threes, which is one of the more incredible game design documents I've ever read. Um, but uh, the, they were equal, right? So the person who was sort of the head programmer, head uh, mechanics, and the person who's the head aesthetics and head UX, those are the two people who were leading the project, and each thing was given equal weight, and they both had their teams. Um, and again, these are smaller games, these are tighter games, these are not you know 70-hour experiences, not 200-hour experiences, maybe, I don't know how much time you've spent in threes, uh, or, uh, but uh, thinking about it really as if you're not thinking about what the, the user is experiencing, then especially, again, with a smaller or more indie game, then, then, what, do, then what are you doing it? And what are you doing there? So, so um, uh, what I distill from that is that it's really about leadership and, and the leadership's vision um, in, in user experience. It's sort of the Steve Jobs model of uh, you know, succeeding through design. Um, you know, well, that, but Steve, uh, Steve Jobs is kind of a taskmaster at the same time. So I think I, think, you know, I prefer something a little more collaborative. Like, here's the vision. And it's more, hey, lead the charge than push the charge, right. if that makes sense. Right. So it's, it's convincing everybody instead of punching them in the face until they do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ultimately, everyone has to buy into that vision, you know, so and that, that's something we did at Radical a lot where people would, I mean, I think someone had met, was that Warren that mentioned he had posters on the wall that said a certain phrase? Yeah, that's, that's him that mentioned that. We had that at Radical. We had, like, once the vision was established, we, like, plastered it all over the place, and I think that helped, including in UI and UX. Right. Yeah, that's so. really difficult on bigger teams. Uh, that was a constant challenge. Uh, Bioshock Infinite, we had... 200 people in one office, and then we had uh, other offices working on it as well across continents, so that was incredibly challenging. So we ended up like, putting television monitors all over the place to reinforce the messages that needed to get out because you know, a rumor mill develops mm -hmm. and within anything that large, and so people start, under, they start hearing rumors and believing rumors, and it's like, wait, 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 that's not the message, it's not the direction. So. You know, we, it was a constant challenge because you know, when, when it's four of you or six of you in a room, it can be really amazing. You all have a meeting of minds. But when you got people working you know, 13 hours apart from you, it gets very challenging. You don't have that direct connection between the right. visionary and then the actual people. Right. All right, so that, that filled up half an hour. Uh, 
two questions. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah. I want to I want to open it up to the audience. Uh, see what questions you guys have. Again, it could be about anything. I saw the first hand coming up here, and there will be a microphone going around. Hi. So my question is about. I think the thing that UX designers even forget about sometimes, which is the tutorial of how you're going to train the user how to use the stuff you've designed. So like the beginning part of it, well, what happens for me is on a bunch of smaller teams, it becomes an afterthought of like, oh, now we have to figure out how we're going to teach them how to do that. So I'm just curious for you guys where that is in your process. Is that something you start out with like, how are we going to train that? Or is it something where it should just be inherent of it should be so easy that they can understand it? Um, I, I really think it depends on the game. I, I think that ultimately it would be nice to say it should be intuitive, so intuitive that you just figure it out. But obviously if you've got a more complex game, then that's not going to be the case and you do have to think about what the tutorial is going to look like. Um, I mean, I, you know, taking a page from like the first Half-Life where the tutorial was in that, that, that like car that he was, that like, I forget what it was, but it was like a going into the, into the mine, not the mines, but the, into the facility and you were kind of, the tutorial was implicit in that. You got, you had a chance to look around, feel how the camera would work. So when you think about tutorials, if you can't have any, if you can have, if you have to have something, it'd be better to have something subtle, I think, usually. That's the better tutorials I've seen, at least. But tutorials is an interesting topic, almost all in the, of its own, and um, how you teach UI and UX from a tutorial perspective is definitely interesting. Yeah, and actually, to give some perspective, I'm thinking about it from doing a lot of VR development right now, so kind of trying to teach these things that just maybe people have never, ever even thought about how they do that before and train that into them. How many people here have played a lot of tutorials in their games? How many people here hate tutorials in the games? It's a constant challenge. I mean, I don't think there's an easy answer to that because you got to teach the player, especially with a very complex game. But I, th I think the best games are the ones that, that do it somewhat naturally. Like if you remember, Halo starts out, and it was kind of an interesting trick, because it was a huge debate in the industry. You know, do people, do people like inverse controls, or do they like uh, you know, the, the quote unquote regular controls? You know, who likes what? And so Microsoft did a bunch of checking on it. They brought in testers, they tried to figure it out, and they discovered that 50% of the people liked it in verse and 50% of the people didn't. So they're, you know, they're like, well, you know, the usual back then was, well, we're going to piss off half our audience. And, but what Microsoft did is, you remember Halo the first time, first thing guys like, hey, shoot this. And what they did was, what you did with your controller, they captured that. It was ingenious. It was such a simple thing to do, but nobody had thought of that. And they were like, oh, well, then they, dis they discovered whether you liked inverse controls or not. It was invisible to you as a player. And to me, the, you know, the best games, if you can find ways within the game to get you into the game and not, hello, this is a tutorial. And, uh, you know, like, I, I love RTS games, but, oh, my God, I hate the tutorials. It's like, you know, because you always got to go through them. And every time, it's like, okay, click on this and walk here. It's like, this has been the same control system for 20 years. No one's done it differently. Stop teaching me to walk, Okay. <laughs> You know, there's got to be a way to do it within the game. And, and I think, you know, that's why there's so much interest in UX and UI design because people still do this, and it's still a challenge. And the more complex a game you have, the harder and harder that is. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the interesting things about um, games is that, you know, people think of that as, as an end-user product, right? It should be easy, walk up and use. The problem is that it's actually an expert system, right? The amount of time you spend with that game it's, it's tremendous, right? A surgeon probably gets less practice before their first surgery. So given that it's an expert system, uh, it shouldn't be a walk up and use interface. I mean, it could be kind of an incremental you know, uh, disposition or something such that you learn over time. Um, but you know, there, is, there, is a, there is a learning curve. And how do you actually address that? And I think that's, that's part of the core UX problem itself. Any other questions? There are some <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, so I work at a company where we do a lot of um, user experience for web, and I haven't worked that much with user experience for games, and I was curious when you guys start doing your user experience testing in your process, is it as soon as possible, as soon as you guys have your drafts um, written down, or do you do it later in the process when you more so have some of your programs written out and some prototypes done? We, in, in my lab, we start immediately. Like we started at the very beginning. In fact, we just had uh, 
we've got a new um, game that we're we're designing and developing uh, with uh, with uh, Filament Games, um, and we <laughs> took drawings uh, <laughs> to some people in um, uh, so target part of our target audience is in New York, and so we we went to New York and spend some time being like, what did you like about this? And would you try this game that uses this other, uh, this, this related set of controls? And what do you, what's easy for you and hard for you? And, what, and then we watch them for a while and we'll go again. But right now we're literally at the drawing stage and we're already spending time with users. Uh, honestly, it really depends on the game I've been, it, and, and the circumstances. On the, on, the, on the business side or the entertainment side, sometimes you inherit a holy mess and you just try to make the best of what you can out of it. Sometimes you have a more ideal situation where you're starting you know, at a good point and, and it depends how far the game is along, how complex it is and technically challenging. I want to do it as early as possible, but if it, if it takes us nine months just to get to a point where there's something playable or to get, you know, I've worked on games where we're trying to redefine the nature of something and so we're kind of at the uh, we're at the whim of what the programmers can deliver, so it'll, you know it, you get laid out of the gate, and ideally you get to the players as soon as humanly possible. But it really depends on the circumstance. Sometimes that's much later than you would have liked, and then you got to just fix the mess and try to try to adjust as you can. But I would say if you're if you're planning and you have the ability to do so, do it as early as possible because everything is theory until you put it into a gamer's hands. Everything is theory. I, you know, I, 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 there's a guy who I worked with at Human Head, uh, uh, Jimmy, who's this, this, yeah, Jimmy Shin, he's this cool guy. You go into design meetings with him, but people just start debating, and they start second-guessing themselves, and, and there's this sort of analysis paralysis, because you can do anything, and, and, and Jimmy would get very frustrated. He'd just walk out of the room, and by the end of the meeting, he'd have something prototype. <laughs> so he'd be like, because he'd just be like, screw this, I'm going to go make something, you know? Because if you can get it, if you can make something and get it, and even if it's crappy art or whatever it is, it's better to just get it in, get it working, and get it in somebody's hands as soon as humanly possible, if you, can, if you have the ability to do so. Yeah, that said, I've, I can pretty much firmly say that I've never done things the way you just described. Um, I've never seen it done. I've never, all the games I've been on, I've been on like 20 or more, titles. I wish that that would, be, that would happen. It's just that usually it's done when the game is playable, and that's going to be way after it's designed on paper. Um, it would be nice to actually be able to, like, kind of like board game designers do, where they actually kind of prototype with just like paper design. I would really like to see that happening more often in the industry overall, because it sounds like a smart way to do it. Yeah, we have a lot of leeway in academia. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, you know, I, I think a lot of people, though, uh, I think a lot of game development companies don't do it because they don't think they can do it. I mean, you got companies, not, yeah, I mean, it's not as expensive or hard to do as you might think. Uh, when we were doing Prey, the original Prey over Human Head, we just bought uh, a, a PC, a video camera. Uh, we set it up so that we could record whatever someone was playing. I don't know, we spent maybe, we went to Radio Shack, picked up some stuff. It cost us maybe 1200 bucks to set up a, a cheap user feedback station. It, you know, because I had read a white paper from Microsoft, and I was like, okay, this is, we should be doing this. And so, and it was just so useful because, you, again, designers would be like, oh, it's going to be like this, and designers are, players are definitely going to do this. And I'm like, okay, see this? All seven of these people didn't do that. So your theory is out the window. And, you know, I think a lot of people assume it's much more expensive and complicated than it is, because it isn't. It really isn't. But you just, you don't think about it. It's outside of your wheelhouse, and you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, maybe someday. And I think the thing is, is you just do it. And nowadays, it's so much easier because uh, you know everything has a camera. It's it's much easier to just record stuff on fraps and and get people playing. So so I think it's you know even if you're a tiny studio, it's worthwhile. It's worth considering. Yeah, there's also a principle in UX design. The stuff that we teach our children, our children, our uh, our students is that um, depending on what kind of feedback you want to get, that actually determines the level of fidelity in which you prototype and show to your users, right? If you want to get feedback on the overall, you know, story, is this even a good idea? Is it a good game? You could actually show them the storyboard, right? So that's called a low fidelity prototype te uh, testing. If you want to get uh, feedback on sort of the menu art, 
right? The four, instead of uh, the low fidelity, you can go high fidelity, you get people to see, well, I'm, I'm confused in the heat of the game, which one is which, right? So that, um, then you go high fidelity. So it's this kind of, the type of feedback you wanna get, and usually you employ this along the way, right? You first start envisioning your game, um, then you would go low fidelity, start with the story storyboard, um, uh, you know, that, that you created your envisioning for your, for your team, and then you move along and increase the fidelity of your prototype. That said, I think, uh there's a whole school of thought on interpretation of user feedback because a lot of times players don't know what they don't like, but they definitely don't like something. And you have to interpret what they're saying. And if you do it well, you win. And if you don't do it well, you end up making it far worse than what it was before. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with that. I actually don't, I ask them, but I don't listen to the specific things that they say. I watch what they do. Like if someone's like, I really hate the blue, and, and uh, also, uh, I had to go left at that point, and I don't like left. And you're like, cool, thank you for your feedback. I will note it. We won't have any lefts. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, but you actually, when you watch what they do as they play or as they try stuff out, that's where, for me, that's where most of the good stuff, although occasionally, you know, I like to listen to them as well and, and see what they're doing, but not just sort of take at their word. Because they're not trained in this. That's not, that's not their job. Next question. There was someone here. Um, so, I've seen in some like articles and um, readings that there's the design trends of trying to eliminate UI and make it more and more minimal in some games. So, I'm wondering if you can make a case for when it's best to do that or when just a well done but complex UI can really shine. Like, what, what, what's the <coughs> thoughts on whether we should be trying to do away with them completely or whether it's really on a case by case basis? I have feelings on everything. So, uh, but the, uh, my is is know your user, know your player, and 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 wor work for the players that you want and that you've got. I mean, I, I love Dwarf Fortress. Like, I don't know if people here know what Dwarf, but it, the UI is 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 for me. I I was trained as a computer scientist. I'm a programmer. Like, I know how to use it, and it's for me. It's not a very inclusive game. It it's you have to sort of navigate 26 menus to 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 select what you would like your things to, your dwarves to eventually mine, maybe. Um, which is, which as a UI is not very minimal and it's not very, it's not very useful, but it's good for me and it's made for me. Um, and similarly, if, I'm, if I want to make the, uh, the UI as, in, as frictionless as possible, um, the, then minimize the number of things that you have to think about. So again, it's like, what are you using it for? What do you need and, and who's, who's using it? Yeah, I think that's entirely contextual to the game. Uh, like, I, I'm a big fan, like, if you hate certain games, play them. Play the popular versions of them, because every game is a teaching experience. You know, I know people, ah, I hate these types of games, I never play them. It's like, well, yeah, but this certain game is selling like 20 million units. Shouldn't you at least look at it? It's some, you know, and I, I, I'll look at games I hate. So, so when I say, like, I'm not a big sports guy. I don't necessarily hate sports games, but like Madden, I looked at Madden, I look at Madden religiously because, it, it, well, I used to, it's gotten kind of stale over the years, but there was a game where you couldn't get away with having everything heuristic in the game. It has to be, you know, those players want pages and pages and pages of stats. They want to know, you know, um, at what point the player wakes up in the morning and how that influences his day. They want to know everything. And you have to have that level of detail. You're playing a game like Civilization, you want the level of detail that's in that interface. So I think, you know, a lot of people, I, I think they're, I've heard that argument over the years, you know, everything should be contextual in the game and it should be in the game. It shouldn't be, you know, your interface should always be in the game. And I just, I think that's not necessarily true. I think it has to be, you know your audience, like you said, and you build the game that fits what their expectations are. And Tim, it seems like uh, what you're saying is that sometimes the interface is actually part of the game itself. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, part of the experience. That's sort of what I was going to say is it's, it's basically, I think that should be part of the design. If you're, if you're going to do it, if you're going to try to have this like minimalistic thing where there's not much UI, there has to be a reason for it. And you only put in the design document if there's a reason for it. It can't just be, oh, this is a trend I'm going to jump on and I'm, you know, someone somewhere said that I shouldn't have UI, so I'm going to get rid of it. It just has to be part of the overall game. And sometimes maybe that makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. So uh, I was just wondering, in your experiences, um, 
how would you approach the um, so when you te you do user testing do you go specifically specifically for your target market or do you go for everybody um, there's a a pretty good uh, talk at GDC where they talk about accessibility and to play test with even people that uh, like you're making a game right but uh, which is a video uh, media but you can test it with even blind people and that actually give you a better user experience for the overall so I just wanted to know what, what would be your take on that well, uh, actually, as a note, there's, a, I think, an accessibility roundtable later today. Oh. So definitely, if you're interested in that, you should go check that out. I think Tim Little is giving that. Um, but so back to the question. I think, you know, in my experience, we test specifically for certain things. So we wouldn't necessarily test accessibility in a, in a game feedback test or a usability test. We would do a separate accessibility test because we want to know specifically about the accessibility issues of the game. So, you know, color blindness is becoming a real, you know, a real issue that we, like years ago, nobody gave a crap. Oh, it's green, it's blue, whatever. We actually think about, okay, you know, reinforcing color with symbology and shape. Uh, those are things we, we absolutely you know, care about. Uh, sound versus visual versus, uh, you know, how do the controls work? How can I access this game if I don't have the ability to use a controller? That sort of thing. Uh, so we actually do, you know, in my experience, we've tested specifically for those as separate things. Now that said, that doesn't, you know, once your accessibility testing is done and you've incorporated those controls, then absolutely, you know, those people take part in the use, user focused testing. But at that point, we're not looking at the accessibility issues, we're looking at the usability issues. So we try to, we tend to separate those because those are different issues that require different solutions, if that makes sense. Yeah, also the, the notion that you mentioned is usually referred to as a universal design, right? If you um, design for the least capable people, uh, your interface is better even for the most capable. Mm -hmm. But remember that, like I said earlier, I think games, uh, games are expert interfaces, right? So there, if you try to uh, design it for low skill, then it's gonna be very frustrating for the high skill or not enriching enough, right? So because of that, I think going for your target and whomever that expert is, is, is really important. Then you can kind of maybe uh, draw a circle around that and you know, accommodate a little broader set of skills, but not too far out that you're actually diminishing the experience for the target. I mean, in my, in my case, I'm, I'm a researcher first and foremost, and I'm, I'm in education is, is my primary department. So I'm, I'm always designing for, in this particular case, we're designing for the middle school students of Queens, and they're a very specific audience. Um, and and it, if I just sort of tested on um, random UW undergrads, it wouldn't tell us, it, honestly, it wouldn't tell us really very much at all. Um, uh, and so we have to actually go and test with that, that target audience um, repeatedly. And they always surprise us. We didn't, we, we, when I designed, I've worked with the New York Hall of Science, which is a science museum in Queens, um, now on a, on a few games that go up as exhibits there. When we first got there, they handed me this brochure that's from Queens, and it said it was the most diverse municipality in the history of humankind, and that, uh, that it's got less than 50% first language English. Uh, and so we should design without um, assuming anyone knows any single language, um, <laughs> and, uh, and that we should design uh, for the extremely diverse and wonderful population of Queens. And so we've not found a way to replicate that uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> and so again, that's, you know, um, it's a bit more specific on my side. So building off that question on universal design, when, if at all, does audio design or other types of feedback, like if you have a haptic feedback from a controller, get mixed in with that, or is that treated fairly separately? Um, I think audio is another one of those unsung heroes. So when you're talking about audio as it relates to UI, you're sort of doubly uh, screwed. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, audio, well, what I mean by that is like, I think that like, it should be considered, right? And, and it, it is in, in, in a good situation it's considered where it's like, should menus be making a sound or not? Or you know, should, um, should the controller be rumbling? Um, I've seen cases where that's done very well, like the team I was with at Radical Entertainment that worked on Prototype and, and Hulk Ultimate Destruction, where it was really thought of ahead of time of when the controller was gonna rumble. But then I've seen cases where it's just like, someone just needed to test it 
So they threw it on something, you know, like, oh, we got to make sure the controller works because Microsoft is going to go through their uh, TCRs and the thing has to work or whatever. And I don't know. So I think both sides of the both, you know, obviously it's better to have it planned out as part of the overall experience, part of the UX. Yeah, on audio, it's hard because audio is one of the things that most affects the feel and play of a game. And oftentimes I've found, uh, I have a lot of good friends who are audio people. Jim Bonney just gave a great talk in here before this talk. Uh, a lot of times they get handed stuff literally at the last yeah. minute. Like we'd have our, we actually when I was at Irrational, I created a separate milestone date just for the audio guys because they were always in a situation where it was like 11 o'clock the day of milestone. And they're like, guys, where's the stuff? I got to get the sound done. You know, I got like four hours to get the audio in. And so I actually created a week, a whole week later milestone date just for the audio team because they were always, they were always coming in heavy and hot. And it was, you know, I, I, f I feel like a lot of audio teams, that, that's what happens. Because the way, especially in Unreal, the way the structure works, it's very hard to get final audio in until everything is 100% wrapped up. And so for that reason, a lot of times it just happens. And you have to hire really good sound designers and hope to God that they can pull it off because unfortunately there isn't a lot of, it, it, there isn't a lot of testing specifically for audio. Uh, that really happens on our side in terms of user design. All right. So uh, one of the UIs I actually really admire is one from Dead Space because they use the UI on the back of the backpack where it's like, oh, hey, there's your health bar. You can see your you know, UI is on your gun. But it's something that's kind of flashy. You can kind of see it. So I was wondering what kind of, what kind of philosophies do you kind of implement for, to help draw whatever UI or user experience of what you want the player to kind of go into? Like, oh, hey, there's a fun little golden ticket over here that the player can go find uh, down this hall. Well, first of all, you know, too soon on Visceral, unfortunately. They, uh, they were shut down very recently uh, so as a studio. <laughs> so no, I'm, I'm, but uh, which is too bad. They were, they're a fantastic group of people. And yeah, that was a, a kind of a groundbreaking UI design, I think. Some really interesting ideas going on there. Uh, when we were doing Bioshock Infinite, when Dead Space came out, we actually spent a good week just looking at Dead Space and seeing what they did and didn't do. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, you know, there's two, I think this comes back to the question about, you know, like minimalist UI and, you know, how complex it is. Uh, you know, there's a school of thought, especially in first person. I think you have a luxury in first person and third person games to pull off a lot more of, of that type of design, having everything be contextual within the world and having, you know, the cues be within the world. Uh, I think. Certain games don't, like you're not gonna get that in Civilization. You're not gonna get that in uh, uh, RTS, games. RTS games, that sort of thing. So it, again, it comes down to the type of game experience, but in first person and third person, yeah, that's, that's a huge area of design for us, and that's, that's something where you want it to make sense within the world and have it be contextual to what's going on. I think that's an area where really great designers are really good at this. A, a lot of companies don't think hard about contextuality that a button, you know, if I have one button, I can actually map several things to that button by having context associated within that button. It makes sense because I'm, I'm here doing this thing, it's an action button. So if I'm, if I'm next to a switch and I hit the action button, I'm hitting a switch. If, I'm, uh, if I have a gun in my hand and I hit the action button, I'm shooting. It, there are ways to make things contextual within the world. And then with the feedback, the actual UI, uh, I think in first person and third person games, you especially have that ability to do so. But there's big time failures that you can look at as well. If you remember a game called Trespassers, which was um, a Jurassic Park game. I don't know if you remember. Uh, you were a female protagonist and your health, to get your health, you looked down at your cleavage and she had a heart tattoo on her cleavage that would reduce. <laughs> So if you ever wanted to know what your health was, you had to look down at your boob. <laughs> it was very weird. It's a, it, so that, uh, to me, it's an example of that contextuality done really, really badly. <laughs> no one wants to talk about that. There's one, I think we have time for one more question. Um, 
So we've heard the joke, uh, the designer designed by theory and then it did play out. Is that funny because it's true? Oh yeah. Okay, and <laughs> then, so why is that? Like, is it because as you know, game designers, we're always making new things, or is it because we just don't know enough yet and it's still ongoing research? Well, so it's absolutely ongoing research and there's always, there's always more theory. It doesn't mean the theory's bad. Um, it, you know, uh, we know a lot about making a lot of things. Uh, we know a lot about how cars work. But even w when you're building or making anything, you learn so much by, we call it praxis which is where you, you integrate theory and practice. You're gonna make a much better thing if you build from theory um, and then you iterate and you really do it in practice and you really make it instead of just sort of having all the theory in your head and trying to sort of apply it. If you iterate it and test it and think about it, you're gonna make the best thing. You can still make a pretty good thing without any theory and then just iterating, but the best things are when you know what you're doing and to some, to, to, you know, to a lot of game designers and developers, they don't need to read all of the theory books. They have a lot of experience and they've integrated a lot of the, the best practices already. But for all the rest of us, um, then knowing what we're doing and having a good sense of how things are going to work before we go and try it and then repeatedly trying it out and learning from our experience is, is, how, we, is how we learn and get better. Yeah, I, I, most designers I know are really smart people and very nerdy people and very passive aggressive people. And so uh, I think it, a lot of designers get very much inside their own head and they think, you know, I've created something. I know in my brain that this is how it's gonna be perceived. And until reality smacks them upside the head, they're very reluctant to let go of that theory. So, uh, you know, uh, going back to that analysis paralysis thing where people just, well, uh, like we, we had a problem with Rational where people got worried about edge cases hey, I've got a design, I wanna do X. Well, hey, here's a really smart way to do it. Why don't we try this out? And then everybody starts thinking about the edge cases. Mm -hmm. Well, what if this? Well, what if that? Well, what if this happens with this? And, and that can go on endlessly and paralyze your team. And you kinda of have to just say, screw it. If it works well, we'll figure out the edge cases. Don't worry about the edge cases. And so I think a lot of designers, because they're smart and they're proud, a lot of times they don't want to let that go. And if you want to be a really good designer, learn to let that go. Like put it in pra practice and find out what people really do with what your theory is. I just want to add one thing, which is that most of the best theories that I know of design, and I teach design, um, integrate a lot of practice, right? So it's not just that the theory tells you buttons always go up and to the left, right? That's not a very good theory. Um, it's that they tell you how to integrate practice and they tell you how to think about the relationships between design and practice. Um, and so it's, it's not that, you know, it's, it's that that's part of best practices and, and how, how we understand theory. Yeah, learn to fail. Mm -hmm. oh. um, yeah, I was, the only th last thing I was going to say on that is I think that theory gets you so far and just realizing that you eventually have to do that. You have to try it out and sort of prove it. Um, some people are scared to somehow, I think, bridge that gap. How do you bridge the gap between theory and practice? I'm not sure the answer to that. I don't know if you just need more practice at the practice. You know, if you need more, like, just confidence to, to actually try those theories, but actually just roll up your sleeves and get down and do it, and that's where you really learn um, if those theories really held true or not. Always be theory, always be practice. Right. Yeah, I think, I think theory has a bad name. It's kind of scary theory. I don't know that theory. Yeah, right? but if you don't have a theory, you're not yeah. starting from anything. Right. That's right. So, I mean, you, know, you can replace the word theory with an idea, right? That's how we test things, right? We come up with ideas, multiple theories, and, and the whole cycle of, you know, uh, build and test and create and test is really, you have multiple theories about how things are going to happen, and you're constantly testing them, right? Well, that's yeah, really the theory and practice are a loop. You know, they're constantly spinning, and right. you have to embrace both halves if you're going to be a well-rounded designer. Great, well, that uh, fills up our time. Uh, let's thank the panelists. Thanks for coming. Yeah.